Hi, I'm Zach Lindsay, and welcome to my teaching presentation. Today I'll be talking about Beyonce. Not exactly, I'll be talking about poetic structure and grammatical mood. Um, Beyonce will help us learn some of our vocabulary. Uh, but before I get started with my presentation, I want to just kind of contextualize what I'll be doing today and the way that I'm thinking about you and the way that I think about uh, how I might use this type of a presentation in class. Um, the first thing is that I make certain assumptions about you. Um, I'm thinking of this lecture as uh, one that I would uh, use in a creative writing class for students who are already interested in poetry. Uh, and so with that said, there are a few rules, some ground rules that I've probably already established at the point that I'll present on this topic. Um, for one, there are a few tools that we'll be using today. I have a handout that you can find in the links below and that I'll also be trying to share on my screen. And I also have a handout that I call Trappings of a Poem. Uh, and this is something that I use throughout classes when I teach a creative writing workshop. Um, it has a few different tools that we can use to help identify ways to structure our poems, for one, um, some of the genres that poetry might fit into, um, and different aspects of poems. And I found this handout really, really useful for me as a practitioner. Um, and I find that it really helps students to develop a vocabulary around creating poems. Uh, a lot of times there seems to be this big mystery to what a poem consists of. And one of the things that I help to do is demystify the poem uh, in the workshop environment. Uh, so concerning the students who this presentation might address, it is for either a lower division or an upper division poetry workshop. The things that we would focus on would be different depending on which class this was in. For instance, there is some vocabulary. Um, we would spend probably a little bit less time looking at the vocabulary in an upper division uh, version of this presentation and a little more time making sure that we were doing exercises surrounding the vocabulary so that we were all on the same page, um, that we were able to have this conversation without tripping up over any of the words that we we're using. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> Again, the tools that you might be able to use for this are in links below. I will do my best to share them as well uh, and to read everything so that um, there's not a required visual component for this. You can just listen along if you would like to. So <clears throat> all the groundwork established. Here's what's going on. I'm in class with you. We're trying to make some poems, and we're also trying to figure out how to read poems for different aspects of their craft. Uh, in order to develop a common language around craft, I've created this handout that has some good starting points for a terminology we might use, both as we're reading poetry and as we're considering ways to both write and revise our own poems. So some of these things, I'll go ahead and pull up the handout. Um, some of these things include ways that we can conceive of the speaker of the poem, for example. What's their disposition? Um, are they presenting themselves with a lot of emotional nearness to the subject at hand, or is it distant? Do we have a human speaker, or uh, is the speaker of the poem a dog? Um, I'm thinking of Alicia Ostreicher's The Old Woman, The Tulip, and the Dog, where we have three different perspectives operating in the same poem. And some other things that we might consider is, is the speaker in the present, or is this someone from the past who is now talking? There are also different gestures that we use, uh, different ways we can consider the audience. Uh, and I, I like to use the term agon, uh, kind of out of context a little bit, but as a way to teach students how there are multiple foundational aspects to a poem that we can use. So <clears throat> we've already familiarized ourselves at this point in the semester uh, with a lot of this language. And so today we're focusing on one aspect of an organizing principle or of structure, which is organizing principles. A lot of us come to poems understanding that, that there are things like rhyme and meter, um, syntax that help to organize the poem, but we might not think about the fact of argument as an organizing principle. Or um, for today's topic, uh, grammatical mood. So I'm going to go ahead and, and stop sharing that. And the goal here isn't for us to think that grammatical mood is the end all be all for creating our poems, but rather that it's one of the tools that we can put in our toolbox to think about how the poem constructs its meaning and how it achieves certain emotional effects. Um, <clears throat> so we'll take a look at two poems that are in the handout titled teaching presentation a little bit later in this presentation, but 
in order to get there, uh, we have to start with some of the nitty gritty. And this isn't, the, this is kind of like the eating your broccoli stage of the presentation. Um, so if this isn't the most fun part, I just ask you to finish your broccoli so we can get to dessert eventually. I promise it'll pay off. Um, what we're going to be looking at are five of the most common grammatical moods. Now these are, uh, means of expression in language. They are, um, I'll give you some exact examples and definitions here in a moment, but they're things that we use daily that we might just not have language for at this moment. Um, so let me open up the presentation and we'll let Beyonce explain to us uh, the five most common grammatical moods. And then we'll talk about how we can use those in reading and writing poems. So in order, just the words themselves, we have the indicative, interrogative, imperative, subjunctive, and conditional. These are not the only grammatical moods, but they're the five that we use most commonly. Uh, and so they're, one, they're the ones that we're most likely to see in poems as we analyze them. The first one that I wanna talk about is the indicative. This is just the type of sentence that makes a statement a fact. Uh, this might be something like uh, the piece of paper is on the table or my lamp is turned on or I sneezed on the beat and the beat got sicker. These are facts. There's no uh, debating whether or not Beyonce means that she sneezed on the beat and the beat got sicker. We take that to be absolutely true. But here's the thing, uh, an indicative grammatical mood does not necessarily have to be true. It states the thing as if it were true. Um, <clears throat> Think of this as just the most common way of, of saying something. Um, anytime we, we make an assertion such as um, this object right here has multiple uh, ways of being moved around, cool, that's a statement. Um, we'll look at this in a little bit more detail when we pull up the packet, but just for now, we can consider it a statement. The second grammatical mood is the interrogative. Uh, this is a fancy word for it asks a question. How are you gonna upgrade me, Beyonce asks. What's higher than number one? This is a mood. Um, so as I was saying before, we already know the way to use this type of language. My whole purpose in, in breaking down the grammatical moods into their terms and definitions is so that we can start to use them as uh, tools of identification. So we know what asking a question is. Now I'm asking you to think of it as uh, an interrogative grammatical mood. Third one, imperative. This is the mood in which we issue a command. Tell them boy, bye, or please close the door. No, that's not derogative. Close the door. Um, often it uses the second person point of view. Um, it often omits the subject. So I don't say, Zach, uh, calm down. I just say, calm down. Um, I can use the second, or I can use the subject, but I don't have to. Okay. I know I'm going a little bit quickly here. We will review these terms in just a moment. Um, I'm just trying to introduce the definition so we can get to the good stuff. This is uh, the subjunctive mood. It is a statement of contingency or possibility. It often expresses a desire of some sort. Uh, this is a type of mood that we don't use as frequently um, in common parlance, especially with uh, with the, um, what is the word that I'm looking for? Um, forgive me, I'll come back to it. I, <clears throat> oh no, I can't. Yeah, okay, I'll come back to it. Um, let's just look at the quote and that'll help us out. Beyonce says the following, if I were a boy, even just for a day, this is a contingency, a possibility. Uh, it also expresses a desire, the speaker of this line, uh, wishes to at least consider what it would mean uh, to be something other than their gender. If I were a boy. And you'll notice that word were right there. That's a really good indicator that the sentence is in the subjunctive. Um, let's take a look at just the last one and then we'll review these terms. The last one is the conditional. This is just like the last one, a contingency, but unlike the last one, this depends on something else happening. So if you liked it, then you should have put a ring on it. Mwah, beautiful. So just to review these terms uh, briefly, we have the indicative, it makes an assertion. We have the interrogative, it asks a question. The imperative issues a command. The subjunctive states a possibility, a contingency. Uh, 
And then the conditional indicates an outcome that's contingent on something else happening first. Uh, if you don't understand all of these terms right off the bat, that's fine. Um, most importantly, we're introduced to them and we can identify just a couple of them. But keep these definitions with you as we move on to the next part of this presentation. Um, <clears throat> what we'll look at now uh, is a couple of poems. And we'll try to compare the way that both of them do something very similar with their grammatical moods. And we'll also see how we can use the grammatical moods as a way of opening up our understanding of how they accomplish what they do. Uh, so if you will be so kind, open up your teaching presentation handout um, or just follow along uh, as I read. We have two poems here. Uh, they're two of my favorite poems. Uh, they're just gorgeous. Um, a couple of things that you might need to know before I get started reading them. The first one is called The Red Poppy. It's by Louise Glick. Um, it's a, an example of a poem where the speaker is not a human. The red poppy is the speaker of the poem. Now, if you're in my class, you already know what I mean by speaker, which is speaker is not always the same thing as the poet. In this case, the red poppy is the one who is doing the thinking in the poem and the talking in the poem. Um, in the second poem that we're looking at, Archaic Torso of Apollo uh, by Rilke, that's an example of the genre of poetry known as acrastic poetry. It's a, it's a poem that's written in response to uh, a piece of art. So let's take a look at the first one. And I'm gonna go ahead and read it. You can follow along if you'd like. The Red Poppy. The great thing is not having a mind. Feelings, oh, I have those. They govern me. I have a Lord in heaven called the sun and open for him, showing him the fire of my own heart, fire like his presence. What could such glory be if not a heart? Oh, my brothers and sisters, were you like me once long ago before you were human? Did you permit yourselves to open once who would never open again? Because in truth, I'm speaking now the way you do. I speak because I am shattered. Oh, God. Oh, it gets me every time. Um, I mean, it's just a devastator. It's just such a, a beautiful poem. Um, I mean, and, and to me, it's amazing that, that a poem that's written from the perspective of a flower uh, can be so like psychologically complex and compelling. Uh, it, it's astonishing. Um, so I want to just like pause and if, you know, if we were actually able to see each other right now, I'd want to check in with you and ask like first reactions. What are the things that stand out? Um, what do you notice about this poem? Um, what, what effect does it have on you as a reader? Um, in a classroom setting or in a Zoom setting where I'm able to see all of you and we're able to have that kind of interaction, that's where we would pause for a little moment. Um, but in, in lieu of that, I'll just say, when I read this, I'm like, mm, I mean, I just, I don't expect to get to that place where I do at the end that's so emotionally devastating. And I, I think a big part of that is because this poem is so thoughtful. It's interrogating itself. The speaker is, is just like wildly intelligent and introspective. And, and then we get to this last part that is just so like gut-wrenchingly emotional. Um, and yet it's kind of understated. There's this sort of intellectualized quality to it. Uh, one thing that, that I'd like to do before we start talking about how this poem constructs its, its meaning through grammatical moods um, is to just break down some of these images. If this is your first time reading the poem, I, it might be a little bit confusing. Um, so something, that, the first place that I think we might be able to, we might trip up on a little bit is, um, as the speaker says, I have a Lord in heaven called the sun and open for him, showing him the fire of my own heart, fire like his presence. Um, so when the, the speaker says, I have a Lord in heaven called the sun, on a literal level, we have a red poppy that exists. We have a sun that exists. The way that this poppy figures meaning out of the existence of the sun in the sky uh, is to give it some significance, to call it a Lord. 
in heaven. And so when this flower says that they open for him, for the sun, for the Lord in heaven, showing him the fire of their own heart, um, I think on the most literal level, we consider this as a red poppy. Uh, and when we think of fire, we think of fire as red. Uh, and so that, that sort of association on the visual level makes a lot of sense. This is a flower that is blossoming. It's opening up to the sun. It opens up almost in praise of the sun, uh, at least toward it. Um, and so we see that redness is opening up. And then it moves on to ask this question, what could such glory be if not a heart? So what's super interesting about that movement right there, um, among other things that we'll talk about, is that at this point, we have a red poppy making some sort of metaphysical sense out of physical facts. What I mean by that is there is a sun, that's a fact. Uh, there is a red poppy, that's a fact. Um, but the sun becomes the Lord in heaven, the redness of the poppy blossoming becomes a heart. So then what's interesting is it says, what could such glory be if not a heart? Okay. So now we have a whole different level of meaning here. Um, this poppy that is heartless, does not have a literal heart, does have a figurative heart, a glory. And it asks, what could such glory be if not a heart? It knows there is not a literal heart, but it says there is at least a metaphysical heart. Okay, I'll, I'll kind of move on here for a second. Um, and then it opens up. So I, I think, I think that's probably the part that, that's easiest to trip up on. So I wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page with the poem uh, prior to talking about mood. And now here's what I would like to do. Um, in the version of the handout that I gave you, there might be a section of it highlighted. I've gone ahead and if we were working as a class, we would have done this together. Um, we would have gone through the poem and identified which of the grammatical moods we see here. Because we're not getting to have that kind of back and forth, I went ahead and cut that corner for us. Uh, what, what I'd love to do is to break up into different uh, groups and to have each group look at both of these poems and identify the grammatical moods to the best of their abilities. And then we would come together and decide on uh, the correct organization. So for example, we have this first chunk of the poem that is written entirely in the indicative. These are assertions. And then right, not exactly in the center, but the middle part of this poem is written in the interrogative. It asks questions. And then what does it do? Well, it just returns to that indicative. So there is this kind of sandwiched structure. Assertions, questions, assertions. That's a major structural organization um, for the poem. If we look for just a moment, what, even without having read it yet, if we look for just a moment at the second poem, we have something kind of similar happening. The poem opens, Archaic Torso of Apollo, opens with these assertions, and then it has um, conditional. So the first third, roughly, of the poem is in the indicative. And then the bulwark of the poem is in the conditional. This depends on that happening. And right at the end, there's this one sneaky little fragment that moves back into the indicative before it finalizes with the conditional. So there is a sort of sandwiching structure there. The indicative, a completely different grammatical mood, the indicative. Um, so let's look in a little bit more detail at the red poppy. In this first section, before we get, when we're just in the indicative mood, uh, before we start asking questions, the speaker is describing themselves, right? The great thing is not having a mind. They're saying what they have. They have feelings, not a mind, feelings. Um, and this would be a kind of objective description of the self, but for the fact that it's super self-conscious of the act of description, um, and so we ask ourselves when we look at that, as the poet asked herself whenever she wrote it, what would it mean for a poppy to think or to feel? Um, this is a way of imagining into the psychology uh, of the flowers. It's like, okay, if we have this, I mean, and it's weird, right? Like if we can just kind of pause and like zoom out and acknowledge, it's weird. We have a flower who is, I think, more psychologically complex than I am. Um, it's compelling, you know, it's, it's, it's 
pretty strange. And it's also this opportunity to take something like a personification uh, or a, a non-human or inanimate object and imbue it uh, with a sort of psychological complexity whereby we get to learn about ourselves. Okay, big ideas. Um, we don't need to worry too much about psychological complexity and imbuement. What we do know here is that we have a poppy thinking. And that poppy is like, I got feelings. Um, I don't have a mind, you know, but my feelings seem to give my life significance. And then it moves into what could such glory be if not a heart? And I'll tell you why I find this super interesting. The interrogative here implies an addressee. In other words, this poem is speaking to someone. Anytime we ask a question, we're asking it of someone. And that someone might just be ourselves or it might be someone else. With this first question, we don't know whether it's a question asked to the self or to another yet. And then we move on. Oh, my brothers and sisters. And it continues with another question. So what's happened here is we've moved through a lot of assertions of self-description into this opening up to the reader. The way that Louise Glick uses the interrogative here is to take a super complex psychological portrait of a flower and open it up to the reader such that they might identify with it. And the way that she does that is with that first question that doesn't seem to be addressing anyone in particular. And then the poppy acknowledges the people to whom it's addressing, the people it's addressing, oh, my brothers and sisters. Um, so there's this transition on the, the focus of the poem from the self to the other. Were you like me once? Um, and if we look at um, this, this last part of the question, did you permit yourselves to open once who would never open again? This is where the poem establishes its crisis, not in the assertions of fact, but in its wondering. Have you experienced this? Did you experience this pain? Did you open yourself? Like I have opened myself to my father and or my Lord in heaven. Did you open yourselves up to something emotional, significant, um, only to never open again? And so there's that connection there between the speaker of the poem, what they're experiencing and the reader uh, that's achieved through this fluid motion from the indicative to the interrogative. Um, and then it comes back to respond to its questions. Did you experience this? Have you been governed by your feelings? Um, have you made significance out of your emotional experience of the world? Um, did you try opening up only to never open again? And then it, it answers as if the question behind that question is what happened? Um, it says whatever happened, I'm like you. I speak now the way you do. I speak because I am shattered. Okay. It's so sad. I know it's so sad. Um, but also, I, I mean, I just can't help but be like really moved by the, the like the beauty of that poem. And for me, so much of the beauty of this poem is the way that it not only establishes that portrait of the speaker, but the way that it opens out in this archetypal way to a common experience that the reader can identify with. Have you loved? Have you had emotional ambition only to be hurt, uh, only to shut down afterward? Um, and when I say it like that, I mean, isn't that grotesque? Like, just this kind of like gross gloss summary of like, have you ever been hurt? Like, it's dumb, right? Like that summary is a dumb version. Um, when we compare that to the specificity of these motions that are achieved through mood and other structural organizational principles, um, the specificity of this opening up to the reader and then coming back to the personal is just incredible. Um, I want to acknowledge though, I have spent a lot of time on this poem. We do have another poem we need to look at. Um, so I'm going to read this a little bit more quickly and go through some of the big points uh, that I'd like to acknowledge. At this point in a class session, I would pause 
I would have spent a lot of time digging in, probably a bit too much um, to that first poem. And then I'd ask students to participate with me in doing the second one, um, either breaking into different groups or just kind of having a Socratic seminar conversation around it. Um, and of course, I'd be pulling up an image of the archaic torso of Apollo uh, so that we could all see the, the source of inspiration for this poem. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and read this. Archaic torso of Apollo. We cannot know his legendary head with eyes like ripening fruit, and yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside, like a lamp in which his gaze, now turned to low, gleams in all its power. Otherwise, the curved breast could not dazzle you so, nor could a smile run through the placid hips and thighs to that dark center where procreation flared. Otherwise, this stone would seem defaced beneath the translucent cascade of the shoulders and would not glisten like a wild beast's fur, would not, from all the borders of itself, burst like a star. For here there is no place that does not see you. You must change your life. Whoa. Okay. So the big question here is, how do we get to that end statement? You must change your life. Dang. Okay. Um, I thought we were talking about art. And then suddenly the, the poet, or the speaker of the poem is, is telling me that I have to change every... Okay. So let's dig in a little bit. What's happening here? I want to repeat that this first stanza is entirely in the indicative mood. So it's kind of like being, uh, it's kind of like saying, this paper is on the table. There's nothing terribly significant about that. We're just asserting something. Um, so we're establishing the rules of the poem. What's interesting though, is the assertion begins in negation. We cannot know his legendary head. So we're already setting up, the po poet is already setting up this piece of art, um, that was a really weirdly phrased thing, excuse me. The poet's already establishing the rules of this poem, which are, we cannot blank without that. Um, so we have the conditional uh, predicted within the first few words of the poem. We know that we're gonna say, we can't blank without blank. If blank, then blank. Okay, so we cannot know his legendary head with eyes like ripening fruit, and yet, so here we have that sort of logical uh, construction of an argument, and yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside. Um, so the first, this is the first assertion that's made in a positive framing as the indicative. Uh, and then as we move forward, um, like a lamp in which his gaze now turned to low, gleams in all its power. We continue to have after this point, a lot of descriptions through negation. Um, this employs the conditional grammatical mood. If this were not so, then that would be impossible. So this first part of the poem is creating the if this were not so part. We cannot know and yet blah, 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 blah. Otherwise, and look at this, this is how the poem is structuring its argument on, on just the most basic level of diction. Um, we cannot and yet otherwise, otherwise for and then this rapid shift into uh, back into um, you must change your life. Oof, okay. So if we're moving this way through negation, um, <clears throat> we get by, uh, let's see, by the end of the, the poem to this phrase, for here there is no place that does not see you. Um, if it's moving through no negation, this part of the poem seems to almost respond to the question of why are we doing all of this? We cannot blank without blank. Otherwise, otherwise. Um, similar to, if you remember just a few moments ago, we were talking about the red poppy. At the end of the poem, it says, because in truth, I am speaking now the way you do. This is the way that the poem is coming back. It's responding to the question. It's making sense of everything that it was just asking. That's what's happening here uh, in a kind of like two-step fashion. Uh, there's all of this talk about this piece of art um, and all of the logic that Rilke constructs to help us make sense out of it. And then there's this kind of answer to the question of why are we doing any of that? Um, it says there is no place. For here, there is no place that does not see you. 
this art seems so significant that even even though the head is completely missing, there's literally not a head on the sculpture. It's so good that it sees you everywhere. There is no place that does not see you. And then that final, I mean, famous, incredible line, you must change your life. Now I wanna think, because we're talking about grammatical mood, uh, I wanna think about how this might have looked different if Rilke had used a different mood. So, if we have, you must change your life, that opens up me as a reader to the speaker of the poem's experience. Uh, they're looking at this piece of art. They're like, oh my God, it's so beautiful. Here's all of the stuff that's really great about it. Uh, it's got I don't know, cool, placid hip and thigh and, and that dark center where procreation flared dirty. Um, and then it's coming to the very end and it's like, everything needs to change. Um, okay, so it's striking, yes. Um, but how would that change if we moved it, for instance, to the interrogative? If we get to the end of this poem and it says, should you change your life? Well, for me, that doesn't feel right. Like that kind of falls flat. Um, conversely, what if it instead used the imperative? Um, let me just read it that way. For here, there is no place that does not see you change your life. I'm, I'm like, whoa, that's a, that's a little much, you know? <laughs> and the difference is only a matter of grammatical mood. And yet the shift from one mood to the next completely changes uh, the argument of the poem uh, and the emotional effect that the poem has on me as a reader. I know that this has been a lot of information and a lot of digging into some of the specifics of the poems uh, that we're looking at here. And it's important to me to keep in mind that uh, these are just tools that we can use to open up poems and to consider ways that we as craftspeople uh, might accomplish something similar in our own writing. So as we look at these and uh, as we think about the way that mood or syntax or anything else structures the poem, for me, it's a matter of, of being able to steal, emulate, if I can break down how this poem's emotional resonance, how these poems' emotional resonances change just based on mood, then I can use that through a process of revision, or if I'm considering different ways to create the structure of a poem for myself. Um, so I can start in the indicative, this happened, move into the question, but what? And then come back to the indicative and, and you know, round it out with some sort of killer ending. Um, at this point, that is, that's kind of the, the bulk of what I wanted to look at in terms of how mood structures these two poems. Um, but no sort of learning or lecture is useful unless we actually apply that knowledge. Um, and so my desire at this point, be you a lower division or an upper division creative writing workshop, is for us to now create something together. Um, so what I would like to do at this point where we in person or where we in Zoom is to take this idea of shaping a poem on nothing but mood um, and take the same sentence such as um, the world is ending and to create a poem that structures just according to moods. So what this might look like as an exercise is I might say group one you're going to do indicative interrogative indicative and you can create as much room on the page as you want for any of those moods. They just have to follow that order. Group two, you're gonna do indicative conditional and you're gonna sneak a little bit of an indicative right at the very end. Um, and it doesn't matter how much space you use for the indicative at the, far, at the start. Um, sorry, I got distracted for just a second. Uh, so we'd break up into groups, we'd, we'd use one sentence or maybe two sentences and create a poem that that's only structural differentiation is through grammatical mood. Um, indicative, the world is ending, ending, interrogative. Is the world ending? The world, is it ending? Is it the world? Uh, back into indicative, the world, it is, it is, the world is ending that type of thing. And we just play around, mess with the syntax a little bit, but mainly focus on the grammatical moods. Um, so I do realize it's been 35 minutes at this point. One thing that I tried to accommodate in this presentation is 
I don't spend a lot of time in lecture. We might do a little bit of breaking down of poems like we've done today, um, but mainly my goal is for us to have these types of conversations together so that we can all get on the same page, figure out how to employ our vocabulary as readers, and then in turn synthesize that knowledge toward the writing of our own poems. I hope this has been useful. Um, I hope it's not terribly awkward for you uh, to watch a kind of person speaking to themselves on Zoom. Um, and if you, if this hasn't answered all your questions in terms of uh, ways that I might approach teaching poetry in the classroom, I do have some other videos on this site uh, from the first time that I taught poetic technique online. Uh, and those consisted of pretty short lectures. Uh, and the way that I set up those classes is, I would have you know, the, the five to 20 minute long uh, craft element speech or genre based speech. Um, and then students would apply that learning to some sort of exercise or activity that they brought far outside of the classroom. Um, so I'll include the syllabus uh, for that class. The, the version of the presentation that I gave is kind of an open ended uh, plug into an upper or a lower division creative writing course. Um, and I hope that you find some of that material useful. It is a strangeness, of course, to, to try to present material without conversation. Um, but I do hope this gives you some sense of the, the type of structural understanding I try to help my students uh, familiarize themselves with. Most importantly, however, this is all toward having productive conversations about our craft. Most importantly to the workshop environment for me is the ability for students, one, to establish their own uh, ground rules and, and safety procedures in terms of the type of feedback that they receive, and also that we can develop a common parlance around discussing poems from a craft based uh, perspective. Um, it is not, in my experience, terribly helpful for uh, a workshop environment to consist of comments like, I love the giraffe, but I wish its neck were longer, um, or I like that. Uh, students get to choose what type of feedback they want to receive in a workshop environment, but also we develop language around uh, the craft elements of the poem uh, so that they know what to expect and so that they feel confident. Uh, even if they're not experts on applying every one of these tools to the reading or the writing of a poem, they know the tools, they can use them and operate with confidence in a conversation around poetry. This, in my experience, helps again, to demystify the process of reading and writing a poem. Um, and frankly, it's just a really good starting point, breaking down a poem into its trappings and thinking about each of these elements, um, whether it's at the moment of creation or in a moment for vision. Um, I'm gonna stop talking though, because I could talk about this stuff all day. And again, I hope you found something here that was useful. And if you didn't, check out some of the other videos and let me know what you think about those. Thank you so much.